So the name of uh, this webinar is Designing a Competency-Based Curriculum, Learn Cube Content Explained. So um, basically, I'm going to start by very briefly explaining the theoretical uh, aspects behind our, um, our content and also the um, educational uh, theories uh, that made us take the design decisions uh, for the creation of our content. So I'm going to talk about that for a few minutes so that it will be easier um, for you guys to understand um, what Cheryl is going to talk about later, which is the content per se, and uh, show a few practical examples and explain our content structure, um, et cetera. Um, so uh, the first question I generally ask when I, um, well, actually, in general, when I am uh, talking about this topic uh, in person or presenting this topic in a room with other people uh, face to face, I like to ask um, everyone who uh, who learned a foreign language in high school, please raise your hands. And then about 99% of the people in the room raise their hands. And then I say, um, okay, now everyone who's still, who is able to speak that language, please keep your hands up. And then like 99% of those people uh, bring their hands down. Um, so I like to do this as well now, but it won't work for two reasons. A, because I cannot see you, and then B, because uh, we are mostly school owners or language school directors or uh, language teachers, and in general, we do speak many other languages. So uh, for a general audience, however, uh, or for most people, that is the case. They study a language for years, and then they are not able to speak it. So that has to do with many uh, problems. So that the cause of that is many different problems, but uh, one of the problems is uh, the curriculum. Um, and this is precisely what we're going to focus on today. So we're going to talk about that problem. Um, so again, going back to the main question and the question that we also ask ourselves when we were trying to create a new different and better content um, is what is the main problem with traditional foreign language curricula. Doesn't matter if it's digital or analog or if you're using it online or face to face. Um, but what is the main problem? So our understanding uh, is that it is a transfer of learning problem. Um, so basically that uh, most students will uh, want to learn a new language because they are trying to use that language in a non-instructional environment. So in a real life setting. However, uh, the learning that occurs in the classroom in an instructional environment is generally not immediately transferable to that non-instructional environment. Um, so there are uh, three main reasons uh, for this. Uh, the first one is that in general traditional uh, language curricula uh, have a lack of relevance. So the student is not immediately um, able to see what like or able to understand that what they are um, using or learning in the classroom uh, that they will be able to transfer it or how they will be able to use it outside the classroom uh, so the content is not immediately relevant or at least the relevance is not immediately evident to the student um, in general for example the um, most traditional language curricula are divided into thematic uh, units. So you know the typical language textbook. Uh, it, ha it, start, it has units like, I don't know, uh, sports or politics. And then uh, the student is not able to see, um, okay, so how am I going to use this? Uh, how is this immediately transferable for me to use in the real world? Um, well, I'm a Spanish teacher. So for example, I have a Spanish book here. So just to give you an example. Uh, um, okay. So let's look at this unit, right? So this is the traditional textbook that we all know, right? So I don't know, the name of this unit is La Vida es un Viaje, Life is a Journey. So as a student, like put yourself on the student side, what is this? <laughs> what am I learning here? What does Life is a Journey mean? Um, what competency am I learning? Uh, so this is not something that is um, immediately transferable to a non-instructional environment, or at least the student cannot see it. So that is the main, uh, I'm sorry, that is the first problem, like a relevance. 
Um, the second uh, problem is that it's an instruction that most uh, traditional uh, curricula are uh, use an instructionist approach. Uh, this is as opposed to a student-centered approach. Uh, so basically the focus is on the instructor and the curriculum, but not on the student. So um, a good curriculum should be student-centered, meaning that it should support the needs of the student not uh, the needs of the curriculum or the school or the teacher. And then the third problem is that it is uh, that there is generally uh, no student agency. So uh, that traditional or instructionist curricula don't support uh, student agency. So um, just in case um, we don't all know what student agency is, I have, uh, well, there's many definitions. They're more or less all the same. Um, I generally like this definition by um, Sturgis, uh, by Chris Sturgis. It's a, an educational researcher. Uh, so student agency is the ability of students to own and manage their learning process. And I would probably add to pursue uh, their learning goals. Um, so a good curriculum should um, support student agency. So student input must be um, uh, like must be taken into consideration. Um, you cannot think of the student as an empty receptacle and especially not everyone <laughs> is the same. So especially not as uh, equal empty receptacles who just absorb content passively. So um, you have to, ideally you would get to know the students before you create a curriculum, but when that is not possible, at the very least you can offer uh, options so that your curriculum supports uh, multiple learning profiles or multiple lear ways of learning or what we call learner variability. Um, so those are perhaps, uh, so, so all of these uh, problems are um, perhaps um, ex uh, a part of this uh, transfer of learning problem, which would be the umbrella problem, right? And it's understandable in a way that uh, this, uh, the traditional curricula uh, have this problem because uh, they need to be standardized because they need to be used at scale. However, now that technology is more present, we have perhaps the opportunity to change and create a new uh, language curriculum that uh, can still potentially be used at scale. Um, so I really, speaking of uh, perhaps scale and how we are using technology now that a lot of schools are transitioning online, um, I really like this uh, quote by uh, Didi, by Christopher Didi. He's, um, he's actually a uh, leading, uh, world leading researcher, um, probably one of the pioneers in uh, educational technology. Um, he's been writing and researching about it for decades. And he was also one of my professors at Harvard. And uh, I really like this quote by him, which is, uh, there is massive evidence from both research and experience that old content or pedagogy in new instructional containers does not produce major gains in effectiveness. Um, so a lot of schools are going online at the moment, and especially now with the COVID crisis, uh, and some of us have been doing it for a long time already. Um, however, um, it doesn't matter really if you're if you're taking your school online and you are not innovating in uh, uh, pedagogy or methodology um, it's really you're basically just going to carry uh, all your old habits or um, instructionist or industrial era um, learning problems to uh, the digital environment so another uh, actually another thing that uh, that uh, that Christy says uh, quite often is that technology is not like fire in that you don't get the benefits from technology just by getting close to it. Um, so if you're taking your school online or if you're starting to teach online, you need to really capitalize on the digital environment and also use that opportunity to innovate on pedagogy, not just uh, take the same format and the same way of teaching online and especially not the same curriculum. Um, okay. So here is what we understand by curriculum, or at least it's the working definition 
that we used when we were creating our curriculum because uh, it's very important to understand that um, we are not just talking about the materials here. So curriculum generally gets confused with class materials. That is just a part of what a curriculum is. Um, we are also uh, talking about assessment when we're talking about curriculum. Um, so, well, um, Cheryl is probably going to show a little bit about um, how assessment is included in our uh, materials afterwards, but um, um, our curriculum includes assessment and in, in particular, we do both formative and summative assessment. Um, so generally formative assessment is assessment that is low stakes and that is conducted throughout uh, the learning process and uh, as we move along through the curriculum and summative assessment is assessment that is conducted uh, normally at the end, it's high stakes assessment. So we try to combine uh, both and especially make sure that assessment is uh, used for uh, learning and that it's not used um, in a way, like in a punitive way uh, or this, like yes, or not, 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 um, uh, not exclusively. It needs to be used in, um, as a way to improve student learning and assess whether the student needs to fill certain gaps before moving forward onto the next unit. Um, or to the next uh, learning stage. And then uh, methods. So we try to ensure and consider that um, our material needs to uh, support um, different methods and different approaches uh, in teaching. So um, it's, um, it's very important to make the material as universal as possible so that teachers who use it can adopt a wide variety of instructional decision and instructional approaches. Uh, and then finally, of course, uh, the goals are also a very, very important part of our um, uh, curriculum, of, of designing a curriculum in general. Um, the learning expectations that you set with students, and you also need to support multiple um, goals as well. Mm -hmm. um, so um, we made several design decisions that were generally based on several educational theories. Um, for example, um, we, uh, so our material supports student um, autonomy. So that is based on independent learning theory. Um, or we also ensure that the material supports uh, learner variability. So that is based on universal design for learning theories. So, um, we actually considered several and took into account uh, several um, several learning theories and also uh, tried to make a lot of design decisions based on that. Um, however, in this webinar in particular, because we don't have a lot of time and we need to focus on the main aspects uh, of our um, curriculum, um, we are going to talk about one or what I think is the main um, uh, or the most important design decision, I would say, which is uh, the fact that our curriculum is competency-based. And uh, it is very important to understand uh, that in order to understand how our curriculum is structured and in order to understand um, how our curriculum needs to be used. Um, so um, based on competency-based education theories, we decided to make our curriculum competency-based. Um, so the working definition that we used for, um, uh, of competency education, um, it's also actually by, um, uh, a study, uh, by Sturgis from 2015, which just said, it actually actually says Sturgis et al, because it's, uh, Sturgis and a lot of other people who participate in that, uh, studies, in that study. Um, so, um, the main definition would be that. Uh, first of all, students advance upon demonstrated mastery. Um, so actually, did, that is a key word to understand competency education, uh, mastery. So it's or, or the focus of competency education on uh, mastery um, rather than on time. Uh, so in general, uh, when you are using like this book, for example, or in general, when you in a traditional uh, in a more traditional approach, you would go over a unit, and then uh, once you are done with a unit, or perhaps it's after two classes or after three classes, then we move forward. We move on to the next one. Um, so we are basically moving on to the next unit because uh, 
okay, we finished the previous one, so it means that you learned the content in the unit. Uh, so uh, yeah, that is, as we know, that is probably like not the case uh, in the majority of scenarios. So um, competency uh, education requires that the student demonstrate mastery in order to move on to the next unit of learning. And uh, if they don't demonstrate that mastery, then they're not going to move on to the next one. Instead, we're going to work uh, on the gaps that we need to fill. Um, so that is a very, very um, important aspect of uh, the competency education definition, the focus on mastery versus the focus on time. Um, second element is the competencies include explicit, measurable, transferable learning objectives. So this is what we talked about before uh, regarding uh, relevance. Uh, so it's very important that the student is able to immediately understand and see, very easily uh, see how they're going to use the competency to, uh, that they are studying in the classroom outside of uh, the classroom, so in a non-instructional environment. So just to give you an example, a competency, if instead of uh, um, uh, having a top uh, themed based unit like politics, if they have a competency like um, giving a presentation, then uh, the student immediately knows uh, what they are going to, uh, or, I'm sorry, how they're going to use that uh, competency outside the classroom um, and what they're going to use the content that they're learning for. Um, so it needs to be explicit. Um, and uh, the transferability needs to be uh, self-evident in a way for the student. And then the third element is that assessment needs to be a, meaning, a meaningful and positive experience for the student. So this is what we talked about before, uh, that our curriculum includes mainly formative assessment. Uh, it's present along the way and uh, not just summative assessment. So it's not just, okay, we get to the, the end of A1 and let's see what you didn't know uh, or what you did know. And now it's too late. Uh, so instead we try to assess the student throughout the learning process so that we can uh, fill the gaps, uh, the learning gaps uh, through the process rather than at the end when it's too late. Um, then uh, the fourth element is that students receive timely differentiated support based on their individual learning needs. So again, this is also related uh, both to uh, formative assessment, but also to uh, student-centered learning. Um, so the curriculum is, um, is there to support the student needs, but it's not the curriculum that needs to dictate what the student needs are. Um, and then the fifth and last element of this definition of competency education is that learning outcomes emphasize competencies that include application and creation of knowledge, along with the development of important skills and uh, dispositions. Um, so again, uh, the competencies need to be immediately um, and instantly um, relevant and explicitly um, uh, and, and, and be explicitly um, uh, understandable in terms of uh, what we're going to use these competences for. Um, so I really like this quote that we have here below, uh, that learning is constant and time is the variable. So um, the students may have different approaches to learning and they might require more or less time, but it's very important that uh, uh, goals are very clear and that they demonstrate mastery before we can move on uh, to uh, the next competency, regardless of what their needs are uh, with regard to time. Um, so here's a few, oh, actually, yes, <laughs> before we move on to the examples. Um, so this is, for, exam uh, for example, a traditional um, uh, textbook. So, Again, this is another, uh, like the example in the Spanish book. This is also uh, a good example of, uh, of what is not immediately relevant to the student. So de decisions and choices. So um, what is that? So I, as a student, if I see that, I won't really know how am I going to be able to apply this, um, this, uh, this, this, this content to a real uh, life environment. Um, so in general, uh, as we mentioned before, 
most traditional language curricula are divided into these uh, sequential thematic units like sports, travel, politics, um, or grammar topics or vocabulary topics like numbers, introductions, irregular verbs. Uh, but it's not clear what specific goal they are serving. Um, and again, as we mentioned before, it's all about the time. So sequence or completion time does not typically vary for each learner. So uh, the focus is not on mastery. Um, our curriculum instead is based on competences that each learner um, and each learning unit represents a real world competency, uh, which the learner is immediately able to apply it outside the classroom setting. So here's a few examples of the units that we uh, that our curriculum includes. So or we have, of course, the more typical ones like ordering at a restaurant. Um, but then we also have some like job hunting, speaking to customer service giving presentations or making small talk. Um, so as you can see, with this kind of uh, units, we're changing the focus um, in that the student is immediately able to answer the question, like, what am I able to do in this language? So I'm learning English. OK, so am I able to speak to customer service in English? Yes or no? OK, so if I master this competence, if I finish this unit, then yes, I am able to do this. So am I, am I able to give a presentation? Yes or no. So um, it's very easy and very explicit for the student to, uh, to know um, what they are able to do in the language that they are learning. Um, so again, the focus is on mastery of practical real life skills as opposed to practicing abstract topics or themes over a fixed time period. Um, so now, so now we move on to the examples. So here's a few uh, um, competences uh, that our curriculum includes. Like for example, discussing my education and career, making and understanding jokes, using polite and diplomatic language, discussing social media. So contrast this with uh, the examples of more traditional language curricula that we saw before. Um, so I think that's all for the introduction. So I'm just going to hand it on to Cheryl and then she can describe a little bit what the actual structure of the curriculum looks like as well as uh, what a few simple units look like.